This is going to be verse by verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Look at that. When Paul says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, he is referring to the fact that some of the Corinthians think he isn't the real deal. So he had to remind them every now and then that he is a true apostle. So he says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? But really, he doesn't need epistles of commendations sent to the Corinthians. And he doesn't need letters of commendation from the Corinthians. Notice how the Bible defines itself in the same verse. Epistles are defined as letters. Epistles of commendation to you are letters of commendation from you. So if you've wondered what an epistle is, right there is the answer. It's letters. An epistle of commendation today would be like a Bible college certificate or something. Does a preacher need proof that he went to Bible college before you let him preach for you? Does he need epistles of commendation to you? Uh, every now and then, Paul has to speak as a fool, as he says. He says he's got to, you know, give his credentials. Sometimes you have to remind people that you are worthy for the job. Second uh, Corinthians three two, you ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So Paul doesn't need an epistle of commendation because the Corinthians are his epistle. Paul explains in the first epistle to the Corinthians that he is actually the one that led them to the Lord. In First Corinthians four fifteen, it says, "For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel." A lot of times you can tell a man is the real deal because he has so many converts who are doing good things. So he says, "Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men." You are an epistle yourself. You are the only Bible some people are ever going to read. You need to try your best to be a walking, talking Bible. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Are you ready to give an answer to any man about any question he asks you about the Bible? You should be an open book. You should be in a walking epistle. Paul says in verse 3, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. So you are an epistle of Christ, but you aren't written with temporal ink that could run or fade. You, were, you weren't written in stone that could be broken. You are written with something eternal and put into something eternal. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 says, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. And Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Psalms 118, 8 and 9, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So, and, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Then he says in verse 5, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. The more right with God you become, the more you will rely on Him. The more you will see that every bit of strength you have is from Him. Your sufficiency should be of God, not in yourself. Galatians 6, 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. Don't let your sufficiency be in yourself, but rather of God. Romans twelve three. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Remember, you're nothing compared to God. Second Corinthians 3, 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, 
For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The New Testament started with the death of the testator, according to Hebrews 9.16. So this means the New Testament didn't start until Jesus Christ died on the cross. After this, he made Paul an able minister of the New Testament. Paul said, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. But the, For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So Paul says, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The letter is the Old Testament law. In Romans 7, 6, it says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, we're in where we're held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. And he said, The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And he said in Romans 7, 9, For I was alive without the law once, but when the, man, but when the commandment came, Sin revived and I died. So he's pretty much saying the moment you realized you broke God's laws is the moment that the letter killed you. Then you had to be born again. You had to be quickened. That means to be made alive. This is because the letter killeth. But you were quickened because the Spirit giveth life. Romans 8, 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So the Old Testament law was our schoolmaster. It is deadly because no one can keep it perfectly. And anyone who breaks it is worthy of death. The New Testament is better. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. 2 Corinthians 3, 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, so you see, it calls it the ministration of death. That's the letter. That's the Old Testament law. It was written and engraven in stones. It was glorious because it was because the law came from God in heaven, and Moses saw the glory of God when he received it. Moses had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, more than once, spending all that time with the Lord, receiving the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament law. And this time spent with the Lord caused his face to shine so much that the children of Israel couldn't even look at him. So it says, But if the ministration of death, that's the Old Testament law, written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. So they couldn't even look at Moses' face when he was getting that Old Testament law. Exodus thirty four twenty nine, And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wished not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. So he, he spent so much time with God, getting that revelation, that his face was so shining so much you couldn't even look at him. Now, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, But if the ministration of death, that Old Testament law, written and engraven in stones. you seen where Moses had those tables of testimony. Written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. His face was shining too much for him to look at him. Which glory was to be done away. Even though the ministration of death, the law, was glorious, it had to be done away because it, it couldn't save anybody. It only brought death. Romans 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. 2 Corinthians 3, How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? The ministration of the Spirit is the New Testament. It's a better testament. Hebrews 8, 6 and 7, But now he hath obtained, now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. If that Old Testament was faultless, there would be no need for a second. There would be no need for Jesus to have died if that first one was faultless. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. But it wasn't faultless. We needed Jesus Christ to die on our cross for our sins because nobody can keep the law perfectly. 
2 Corinthians 3, 9, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Now he calls the ministration of death the ministration of condemnation. That's the law. He calls the ministration of the Spirit the ministration of righteousness. That's the New Testament. And the ministration of righteousness exceeds in glory. A man could uh, keep most of the law, and that would be his righteousness. But the ministration of righteousness has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness. Keeping the law is about your righteousness. But the ministration of righteousness, the New Testament, is about Jesus Christ giving you his righteousness. And that's why you get to go to heaven. Because he kept everything perfectly. When Jesus Christ was talking to John the Baptist, he said in Matthew 3.15, and Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Jesus Christ did everything a person must do and abstained from everything a person shouldn't do. He fulfilled all righteousness. So when you get saved, he gives you his righteousness and then doesn't even impute your unrighteousness to your account. In Romans 4, 6 through 8, it says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man into whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So Abraham, before the law, was given imputed righteousness for believing God about his seed. David, under the law, had the sheer mercies of David. And other men under the law had to try their best to keep the law and then offer the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it. They didn't have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ as we have it today. They had their own righteousness. Deuteronomy 6.25, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So that the law has to do with their righteousness. The New Testament, that's the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness. Now, the average man would jump up and say that your teaching works salvation when you say that. But no, you're not getting it. I'm, I'm teaching the Old Testament saints had to keep the law and offer the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it. None of them kept it perfectly. And also, their own righteousness was never good enough to get them eternal salvation. So listen, listen, please. Don't put words in my mouth. I'm not teaching the Old Testament saints were good enough to earn eternal salvation. They were simply safe until Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood. Everyone who got to heaven got there because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But don't forget that the Lord did not apply the blood of Jesus Christ until the sacrifice of Jesus Christ actually took place. Even though he saw through his foreknowledge that Jesus would die on the cross doesn't mean he went ahead and applied the blood to them in the Old Testament. You get the idea that a lot of preachers are thinking that the the that they uh, God went ahead and applied the blood to the Old Testament saints, but if that's true, then why did He make them do bloody animal sacrifices? So they needed Jesus' blood and the bloody animal sacrifices. That's not the case. They had the they they had to keep the law, off of this prescribed sacrifice when they broke it. This kept them safe. They wound up in paradise in the heart of the earth when they died. They didn't get eternal salvation from those things. When Jesus died on the cross for their sins, they were allowed to then go to the third heaven. Anybody who ever got saved and in heaven got there by the blood of Jesus. They just didn't have the blood of Jesus applied until the blood was actually shed. So for these reasons, the New Testament is better. The New Testament is about the righteousness of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.10, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. Even though the ministration of death, which is the ministration of condemnation, the law, was made glorious, it had no glory when sitting next to the ministration of righteousness, which is the ministration of the Spirit, the New Testament. The New Testament excelleth past it. So it says, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. So many times I hear preachers say that the Old Testament saints were looking forward to the cross. They make it seem as if the Old Testament saints knew all about Jesus and knew that Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross for our sins. 
that make it seem as if the Lord applied the blood of Jesus Christ to the Old Testament saints before the blood had even been shed. And the problem with that is if that is true, then why were they required to offer the bloody animal sacrifices? It's because the blood of Jesus Christ was not applied to them before the blood had been shed. And the bloody animal sacrifices were a picture of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, shedding his blood. But those bloody animal sacrifices did not save anybody. As it says in Exodus 34, 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. If they had the blood of Jesus applied to them, then their sins would have been cleared, like ours. But they didn't. They just had those bloody animal sacrifices. And Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Even though those bloody animal sacrifices picture the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, they still didn't take away sin. Because just because it's a type doesn't mean it's exactly like the type. But the blood of Jesus Christ does take away sin and makes you righteous. And this is why the New Testament is better than the Old Testament. They didn't have it available to them in the Old Testament. If the Old Testament saints got all the benefits that we have today, as preachers try to teach you, they make it seem like they were looking forward to the cross. They had the same exact salvation in the sense that they were they had e e etern they had eternal security, assurance of salvation, and that they had a, the blood applied to them. If that's the case, then why is it today a better testament? Why is the New Testament better if it's the exact same in the Old Testament? That makes absolutely no sense. And once again, don't try to put words in my mouth and say I'm saying they were saved by keeping the law. When I, when I plainly said, nobody kept the law perfectly. And the bloody animal sacrifices couldn't save. You admit that yourself. Just quit trying to make them the same when they're different. You got people sitting here trying to say it's all the same when Hebrews itself over and over says it's a be New Testament's better. How can the New Testament be better if it's exactly the same? But still, with an explanation like this, I'm still going to have someone paint the picture that I'm teaching Old Testament saints are in heaven today because they work their way there, which they're just not listening to me. They're hearing only what they want to hear. Um, 2 Corinthians 3.11 For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Another reason the New Testament, the ministration of righteousness and of the Spirit is better, is because the ministration of death and condemnation is done away, and the New Testament remaineth. Romans 10.4 for, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Jesus Christ fulfilled it, he's the end of it. 2 Corinthians 3.12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. This hope is a sure thing. It's a sure thing that you're saved if you have believed the gospel. It's a sure thing, and it's your hope for him to get you in at the rapture. So Paul uses great plainness of speech. Even though he is an educated man and could speak other languages and make himself look way smarter than all the other preachers of his day, he used common talk of the common man in the street. And he says in verse 13, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. So look at Exodus 34, 31 through 35. It says, And Moses called unto them, And Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. And when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel, that he, which we, he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil up on his face until he went in to speak with him. So, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.13, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. 
Moses had so much God on him that he had to cover his face up. Moses' veil pictures the blindness of Israel. They couldn't see the, sh the shine because of the veil. Even today, as a, as a whole, Israel is blind to the New Testament. They can't see the, sh the shine. The, Jesus Christ is, is the, the image that would shine unto them. But they can't see it. They still got that veil. When Jesus Christ came to them, they didn't receive him. When me and you look at the Old Testament, we can find Jesus Christ on every page. When they look at it, they don't see it. That's why the Bible says, Whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. They still got that veil to where they can't see it. 2 Corinthians 3.14 But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So the idea that most preachers give you is that the Old Testament saints were so aware of everything that we're aware of today. They don't get that from the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, even had to sit down with the disciples who walked and talked with him for three and a half years and explain the Old Testament scriptures to them. He had to go back and show them how the prophets were pointing to him. See, look where it says in Luke 24, 25 through 27. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So the Old Testament prophets didn't even understand, but they wrote about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the disciples who walked and talked with Jesus were so unaware that Jesus was portrayed like this in the Old Testament that it, Jesus had to literally set them down and expound unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And But the Old Testament prophets didn't even understand. As you read in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, it says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now look at this. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us that administer the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So even the Old Testament prophets who wrote down all these prophecies about Jesus, they didn't even understand it. But me and you, we have the Lord Jesus Christ. We can look back in the Old Testament and understand that Jesus Christ is on every page. 2 Corinthians 3.14, But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. When you get born again, the blinders come off, Jesus Christ comes in, and the lights turn on. You got rid of a veil, the veil that was on over it. Second Corinthians 3.15, But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Just like the veil was on Moses' face, the veil is on in their heart when they read the Old Testament. Notice it has to do with the heart. It's a heart belief. That's why in Romans 10, 9 through 10, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made in salvation. It's about the heart. It's what have you believed from the heart. 2 Corinthians three sixteen. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. When the Lord comes back at the second coming, the Jews' eyes are going to be opened. And Paul says in Romans eleven twenty five through 26, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So they're going to be restored. They're going to have the blinders taken off. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This proves the deity of the Holy Spirit. It says the Lord is that Spirit. 
and where the Spirit of the Lord is, you'll find liberty. If you go to a church and you can talk about anything in the Bible, then you have a lot of liberty there. If you have to stick to a certain group of topics or be kicked out, then you don't have liberty. The Holy Spirit gives believers freedom to be who they are in the sense of their personality and things like that. And it gives them the, the freedom to talk about anything in the Bible. Men who get into the Bible and read it a lot will end up being very different and, and an individual and not just a copy of someone else. Many times you'll see somebody that's a new Christian and they act just like the person that led them to the Lord for a while. But then when they get in the Bible, they start reading it, you'll see that they are also an individual because God makes individuals, not just copycats of each other. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Bible is that glass. James 1, 22 through 24 But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. The more you read the Bible, that mirror or glass the more you'll begin to be changed and be more and more like Jesus Christ. You'll be able to look in that mirror and change what needs to be fixed. And that's the way it is when you look at the Bible. You open the Bible, it's like a mirror. You can see what needs to be fixed. Just like you look in the mirror, you can see your hair it is looks awful. You can see you, you, you need to fix everything. Your clothes, your buttons on wrong, your... You got, your eyes are matted. All these different things that you see when you look in the mirror. When you approach the Bible, you open it. And all these things you can see about your life that need to be fixed. But the Bible is that mirror. But this has been 2 Corinthians chapter 3.